you have your Bible. If not, we'll have the scriptures up on the screen today, but we're going to read a very familiar passage of scripture, John <clears throat> chapter 1. It's good to see some people um, here today. Caesar is with us, and we're really glad, and, and mercy, and we've been praying for him, yeah, for sure, for a while, and he had a little setback a few months ago, but we're glad that he's with us today, and um, Adrian, Danielle, it's good to see you, yeah, we're glad, and I'm glad to, to have each of you who are with us today. I want to encourage you to be praying, as we mentioned, and be thinking about um, people with whom you can share the gospel. I mentioned this already, we prayed already, but yesterday, 20th anniversary of 9-11, and uh, just the reminder, I hope we don't forget what happened that day. Um, it's a reminder of the darkness that is in this world at times. Uh, all that's happened, um, uh, all that's taken place overseas, throw in all the natural disasters, the flooding, two hurricanes in a month coming through New York. I mean, what are the odds of that? By the way, let me just say this. Um, you know, we're not to live in fear. Uh, you know, I heard someone this week, our biggest enemy now is the climate. It's coming after us. Look, the truth is when you study the science, you realize there are less deaths because of climate-related activities today than there have been in the last hundred years. That's because we're better prepared. We have technology better than in 1900. They didn't know earthquakes were coming. They didn't know hurricanes were coming. But the reality is these things aren't going to stop uh, the, because God said they weren't. Um, sin has brought all of this into being, and all that's happening is a result of the earth dying and mankind dying in their sins. You say, well, that's horrible. It is. But God uses these things to open people's eyes. The pandemic in the last two years, not the first pandemic, the first for us, uh, but it has just had devastating results. Uh, 200 and 49 million people contracted coronavirus, 4.5 million have died, it's 2%, 2% too many, but, but even more than the deaths and the sicknesses, just life has turned upside down, the fear factor, um, it's had devastating uh, results. We talked about socially, all that's happening, the woke culture, everybody knows now they're a victim, everybody feels they're oppressed, and now you're judged based upon how woke you are or not. Businesses are judged. Uh, it's, just, it's just sad. But the reality is God uses these events to begin to work in people's hearts and lives. And one of the encouraging things over the last two years is many people I know that I've encountered, and perhaps you have, are asking questions, are asking about God, or why is this happening and how do we get through this? Now, some are just rigid and some don't want anything to do with it, but God desires, like this banner said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's concern is that every human being have the opportunity to hear his gospel message and make a decision to either trust or to reject him as Savior. And he desires that they all receive him as Savior. That's what God is concerned about. And so God uses the events of the day to really work in people's hearts. Frankly, people have asked me, and I believe it's true, if you've read the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, you know there's a lot still coming. And frankly, the time will come when all of mankind will do what, what they're absolutely told that they have to do and there's going to be one religion, and if you don't follow that world religion, you're going to be killed. If you don't bank where they tell you to bank, you're going to be killed. If you don't take marks, you're going to be killed. And you read scripture, we as Christians are gone. God takes us home to heaven, and hallelujah for that. But all of those horrific things in the tribulation, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of months, but the, the reality is they got to start somewhere. 
And so I don't think it's a stretch to, to think and consider that maybe some of the upheaval in the world today is really leading toward the end times. I, I think that's, um, that's fair. But again, as Christians, if, if you know the Lord, it's not a time to be fearful. It's just a time to, to be reminded, I'm still here because God has a purpose for me. And that purpose is to share the hope of Jesus Christ with people who do not know. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to study John chapter 1. And John has a little bit different perspective of Jesus than, let's say, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They really speak a lot about how Jesus came and his lineage and all the supernatural events, which are very important. But John, he had that unique relationship with Jesus, very close to Jesus. He's his cousin, and he's the last living disciple when he writes this book. And as an old man, he, he's able to look at things from his experience. And he writes the Gospel of John really from a heavenly viewpoint. And, he's, and he speaks about why Jesus came and some of the theological reasons why Jesus came. And, and, and he explains in John 1, Jesus came to bring good news. Gospel means good news. 99 times in Scripture, uh, the, in New Testament, the word gospel is used. And Jesus came to bring good news, and John explains that. And we're going to read a little bit here in John chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, we'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a minute. This gospel message that is so important, we know, is the message that Jesus has for the world. And again, it's important for us to remember it's not really Jesus' priority to get all of us to think the same way politically. It's not really Jesus' priority for all of us to, to be super successful financially. To be honest, it's not really Jesus' priority that all of us just avoid COVID. I really believe that what you're going to see is it's, it's going to be around. It's, it's a flu. And no matter how many flu shots we've had over the years, the flu still comes around. And so we're just going to have to learn to live in that. And, and frankly, not that Jesus isn't concerned about our health, but his main priority for this world is that they will know his gospel, his message. The message that Jesus has for mankind, we're told, is a message that the whole world should hear. Matthew 24 and verse 14, Jesus said, And that gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, then the end shall come. Do you know that there are still people in the world who have never one time heard a clear explanation or presentation about who Jesus is? Now, many of us, we've heard dozens of times. There are people in our city that if you ask them, tell me who Jesus is, and, 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 and what he came to do. They couldn't tell you. And Jesus said before it all ends, all the nations should be able to hear. Mark chapter 13, the gospel must be first published among all nations. Mark 16 and verse 15, Jesus said that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Have you noticed that many people will not come into the church? How many of you have ever spoken to somebody, invited somebody, and they said, no, I'm not going to a church? They're just not going to do that. But what's interesting is Jesus said, we as the church, we who know this gospel, we're to go to them. We're to share with them Jesus' message. And it's for all of us. It's not just our Sunday school teachers or Bible teachers or deacons or the pastor, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you've heard his message, you've trusted him, then Jesus said, it is your responsibility and mine, take ownership, we're to seek to try to share this with someone. That's kind of why we're challenging you. Think of someone in your life that you know needs Jesus. And then, what are you doing to share Jesus with him or her? And I get it. You might say, that's just really not my skill set. I'm not really gifted in that way. And I, and I understand that. Some of us really are. And 
But, but the reality is we're, we're not exempt. We're to find a way. We're to pray, God, show me. Give me opportunities where I can bring somebody to you. And we'll talk about that in the next few weeks. That's how important his message is. That's the message that he wants the world to know. Paul wrote in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, none of these things in life, none of these things move me. I, I, I don't care what people think, what people do, what I have, what I don't have. It doesn't really matter. I don't even count my life dear unto myself. All that matters is that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received of Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. All I want to do is make sure that when I take my last breath, I did everything that I could to share Jesus, this message, this gospel, with as many people as I could. I've read enough in the last several weeks. Uh, I've read missionary reports, of missionaries who were in Afghanistan who were able to get out, but how they are in contact with their congregations and how these dear Christians know that their days are numbered. And I read this week of um, an American missionary who got out, and he, and he said, I, I want to share, I saw it on social media, I want to share a message from, from, from many in my church, and how they, they told their pastor, pastor, look, we know our days are numbered, and we can either hide out in our houses or go run into the caves for whatever time we have left, but we are not going to do that. And they are going door to door in their neighborhoods, asking people do you know about Jesus? Can we share Jesus with you? Would we do that if our lives were on the line? That's how important the message has to be. Paul would write in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the message of Jesus. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. That's what brings power it's the gospel of Jesus that changes everything. How many of you, you think back at your life and, and you, you, you can honestly say, I am different today than I was because of Jesus? I mean, there is no other explanation but because of Jesus. How many of you look back and think, I can't believe I used to do what I used to do? I can't believe I used to think that that was okay. Jesus changed me changed my family. Jesus can change all that's happening. He's the only one that can do that. He would continue to write Paul to the Romans, and he said, beautiful are the feet of those people who bring this message to other people. I got to be honest, I've had people, uh, we were joking about it today, a couple of people came up and said, Pastor, you look um, um, younger. I don't know how to take that. What did I look like before? That was concerning, Okay. <laughs> But I can tell you, nobody's ever come up to me and said, you have beautiful feet. <laughs> and newsflash, I'm flat-footed. Nobody probably would say that. But Paul said, beautiful are the feet of those people who go the extra mile to share the message of Jesus. We get so distracted with all this stuff. There's so much division and walls, and, and we get caught up in it. And that's what the devil wants. And you know what? Just blow it all apart. It's about sharing Jesus with people. Paul would write the Corinthians and say, look, if this gospel, our gospel, if we hide it, it is hidden to those that are lost. It only hurts people that don't know Jesus. These people who the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. There is a real enemy. Can I tell you that the unbelievers in our city are not our enemies? Those people who are of the different political party than you, they're not your enemies. People who are vaccinated or people who are not vaccinated, they're not your enemies. There is an enemy, his name is Satan. The unbelievers are blinded spiritually. 
They, they don't see, they don't understand, and they're desperately trying to find answers and hope and all these different things. And you and I, if we know Jesus, we, we have that light. It makes sense. We understand it. It gets frustrating, and, and we get angry sometimes and impatient and discouraged, but we got to understand they're being blinded. But how is that, 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 that shade going to be lifted? How will the light be seen if we don't tell them the message of Jesus? That's what we're tasked to do. Paul would remind the Ephesians, it was the gospel that saved you. He would remind them in Ephesians 6, please pray for me that I'll have boldness when I speak the gospel to people. How many of you have ever found it's hard to talk about Jesus with people? It's hard. Not everybody likes it. Some people tell you to get lost. I don't want to hear it. But yet it's, it's needful. Paul reminded the Philippians, may your lifestyle, may your conversation, everything you do only be that which becomes the gospel of God. That everything you do, your attitude, your actions, where you go, how you conduct yourself, everything you do in and out, in private, in public, let it just ooze the gospel message of Jesus. What is that message of Jesus? That he died for us. That he was buried and that he rose again from the grave so that we could have a relationship with him, have our sins forgiven, and have life eternal. That's the gospel message. And that's what we're tasked to share. Are you sharing it with someone? Am I sharing it with someone? John goes into greater detail. John chapter 1. Let me tell you about this Jesus he, he, he really summarizes. Because this gospel message of Jesus is only as good and powerful as the source. It's only good news if the person delivering it can, can follow through. This is Jesus' gospel. Who is this Jesus? So John says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal a side of Jesus, reader, maybe you don't know. Let me talk a little theology. John 1, verse number 1. Here's what the Bible says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is God. That's in essence what he is saying. God came to us in the flesh. He came so that we might be saved. He describes Jesus from a heavenly and theological perspective. Notice, he, he, he reminds us that he's not just a good guy. He wasn't just some dude that had some superpowers. He wasn't just a nice teacher or a prophet. He was God. In verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, that sounds like Genesis 1, doesn't it? In the beginning, Genesis 1, God created the heaven and the earth. John said, in the beginning, verse number one, what do we know? The word, capital W. He's going to refer to Jesus as the embodiment of the words of God. The word was with God. He doesn't say there was a word who was with God or this word had to be created by God. That definite article, the, he was already in existence. The Word was with God. Why? Because the Word was God. He was God. Our Jehovah Witness group that you see all throughout the neighborhoods, and their Bible, the New World Translation, perhaps you've studied with them, or you know people who've been with the Jehovah Witnesses, and they'll often say, oh, we believe the Bible, but their Bible is... It's not your Bible, it's not my Bible, it's the New World Translation. 
who was put together by their founder, Charles Tazzy Russell, and he quotes the King James Version for most of it, but he omits certain verses, and he changes certain words, and he, he attacks the deity of Jesus. And in essence, in, in, in their version, it would say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. He was created by God, who is the only eternal being, God. And here we're told Jesus was there. Why? Because he's God. And if there's any doubt, verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. And verse 3, it was he that created all things. That In verse 3, nothing was made apart from him. In Colossians chapter 1, and you can mark this down, I think we have those verses, but Colossians chapter 1, Paul would write, giving thanks unto the Father which made us, and meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, we're in light, verse uh, 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, verse 14, what are we told, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. He is that image, that tangible representation of God. He's the firstborn of the creature, far greater than anything that was ever made is Jesus. For by him were all things were created that are in heaven and in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers of all things that were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things exist. Jesus created everything. I thought God created everything. Exactly. Jesus is God. So going back to John chapter 1, this message, this gospel is coming from Jesus. Jesus is God. He comes to deliver this message to mankind. And what is it? First of all, he came to bring life. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Life begins with Jesus. 38 times John references life. If you ever get the chance to go to the Creation Museum right outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, it's amazing. Many of you have been, and we took a trip a few years ago, and the ark is there, a, a full-size replica of what they believe, measurements, it's amazing. And one of the exhibits they have there is what they call the seven seas of history, and you walk through it, and really they try to summarize the Bible and in, in in, in man's history into seven categories, creation, corruption, how man fell, the catastrophe that ensued, the flood, confusion, Tower of Babel, man thought they could do it their way, and then thousands of years of just not knowing, and then Christ, then his cross, and then how all that he did, the consummation of how it all comes together. Those themes in the Bible, I think you can even uh, 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 dilute it a little bit more into these narratives. There's that creation. How and why we all came into existence. How did we get here? The Bible tells us. That's why the book of Genesis is so important. If your beginnings are wrong, everything else is wrong. So as you read, you realize why we're here and, and what God did. And, and so it answers those questions which so many people have out there today. And then the fall, why did everything now go wrong? Why aren't things working? Why aren't people getting along? Why, why are things, despite our best efforts, just not seeming to be resolved? The fall of man, sin, disobedience against God, sin leads to death. But then the redemption that Jesus came to recover, to save, to rescue all that he could that was lost in the fall. And then restoration. What's going to happen when Jesus comes back and he puts things right and he deals once and for all with the curse and the sin of the world? Here's what you find when you read the Bible. To get to the meaning of life, you have to understand who Jesus is. 
Life does not make sense if you do not know Jesus. People try to figure it out, try to have answers, and try to have explanations, but it is all void if you don't know Jesus. There, if there's no Jesus, there is no creation, and then there's no natural world. If there, it, it, nothing exists apart from Jesus. Everything finds its meaning in Jesus. Nothing is here in creation that he did not make. And Jesus, we said this before, continues to create. He tells his disciples, I'm going to heaven, and in heaven I'm going to build and create for you a mansion. But understand this, I'm the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Life does not make sense without Jesus. Christianity is not here just to help people, you know, have a better life. Christianity, knowing Jesus, is life. If you don't know Jesus, you have no life. And people we meet, they are physically alive, but they don't have life. They are existing. But until you know Jesus and you're born of the Spirit, now you have spiritual life, everlasting life. Now you live. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. And people are desperately looking for life. They're dead men walking unless somebody strives to tell them the message of Jesus, that only Jesus brings life. What am I doing? What are you doing to share with people that Jesus is the source of all life? He's holding it all together. Peace, peace only comes through the Prince of Peace. Hope, hope only is found in the blessed hope. Life, he is the resurrection and he is the life. No Jesus, no life. And John says what you need to know is that God came to give mankind true everlasting life life and amen for that that's part of his message not only that he came to bring life but if you look here in verse number five his message was that he came to bring light when i was a kid i was afraid of the dark anybody else here afraid of the dark when they were a child how many of you're still afraid of the dark okay all right okay well, we've got a few brave uh, people. Have you ever noticed that the smallest light can drive away the greatest darkness? The smallest light can cause the most powerful darkness to flee. Jesus came to bring light. Verse 5, and the light shineth in darkness. We, as human beings, are born in spiritual darkness. And we see that every day. We say, boy, such darkness. How could people do that? But if you're honest, you've, you've, you've asked that about yourself. How could I have done that? Those of you who know Jesus... Have you ever thought back about your life before Jesus? And have you ever thought to yourself, how did I do that? How could I have treated somebody that way? How could I have thought that was okay? But you didn't seem to know. Have you ever been in a dark environment and you really, your eyes adjust but you really don't realize how dark it is until you're exposed to the light. You open that door and, wow, oh, that's so bright. And then we say, it was really dark in there. But 30 seconds before, we didn't have that same assessment. Men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. We're born sinners, and we like it, and we live in it, and we prosper at times, and, 
and, and, and that's our world, and frankly, sometimes we don't even know. And not until we're exposed to the light do we realize the darkness in which we are living. Had God in the flesh not come here, we would not have known the darkness in which we were living. We couldn't get to him, nothing we could do. We're filthy spiritually. We're dirty, we're soiled. We've offended a holy God. We're in darkness but to show the greatness of God, he comes to us and in doing so shines a light on my sin, shines a light on the fact that I'm so far removed from God. I can't save myself. I can't clean myself up. I can't be like God. I need a savior. There's no light apart from the incarnation. There's no light apart from Jesus coming. And light and darkness don't blend together. They're contrary. We are born in darkness. That's why we continue to sin. That's why we become addicted. That's why we doubt. That's why we do the things that we do. And the, the, the ability, the solutions to all of the problems we have in life they're not found in us because we're in darkness. And that was revealed and confirmed when Jesus came to us to help us. Light is metaphorical. What John is saying is Jesus is the reality. He's the ideal. He is the truth. John 12, verse 46, Jesus said, I am come a light into this world so that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. I came to break the darkness, the broken world, the desperation that man has to be redeemed. Each of us has that need. If you're here today and you might be thinking, I, I need a savior. I need to have my sins forgiven. I need to have a relationship with God. Then you're here at the right place. Jesus Christ came to this earth and died for you and paid your penalty. And, and he rose from the dead and he offers you a gift and that's eternal life. All you have to do is receive. I pray you'll do that today. What about all of those people around us? And our co-workers that we work with day after day, month after month, for some of us years after years, our neighbors, our family, God wants them not to perish but to hear his message. He came to bring light. Without light, we wouldn't know what darkness is. Genesis 1, remember what God said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What else does he say? And darkness was across the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be what? Light. God's word spoke. And it brought meaning and it brought light. Jesus is the Word, the capital W. And He was brought into this world to bring meaning and to bring light. Apart from Jesus, everything in our life is meaningless, without purpose, and darkness. And the people all around us are just like we were as unbelievers. And they need to know Jesus. When Jesus enters a life, he changes everything. But we can either receive him or reject him. He came to bring life, he came to bring light, and he came to show his love. Notice here in verse number six, we're told that there was a man from God whose name was John. And this John was a witness but to bear witness of the light. John wasn't the light himself, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9, 
That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 10, Jesus was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. There are people that don't know about Jesus. Verse 11, and then he came into his own, and his own received him not. There are many who know about Jesus, but have just rejected him. But verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But to those, hopefully to you and to me, those of us who realize I need a savior and we turn to him and we put our trust in him, he gives us the power. He births us into his family. We become the sons and the daughters of God for all eternity. Verse 13, we were born, not physical birth, but a spiritual birth. It wasn't by our blood because of what family we were, we were in. I'm not a, a saved, I'm not a child of God because I grew up in a certain family. And I'm not a, 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 a saved because of the will of the flesh, because of something I did. I went to church every week my whole life and I always gave money and I was super kind. No works of the flesh can take you to heaven, can wash your sins away or mine. It's only Jesus. It's not even by the will of the man. I have a really big desire to be with God one day in heaven and that should be enough. It will not be. That salvation is only of God. Verse 13. It's only turning to him and recognizing he came to us. God in the flesh. He died for us. He paid our penalty. He offers to you and me salvation and I want to receive it through you and you alone. Only by repenting and believing in him can I be born into his family. Maybe you've never made that decision today. Today you can make that decision. All your good works, all my efforts, not enough. And every person that you and I encounter and speak to and work alongside that live in our house, they need to know that Jesus did for them what nobody could do. Verse 14, so John said, and the word, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, the word of God, God himself came to us. We saw him, we heard him, we observed him, and there was no doubt he was God. That's his message. He came because he loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Robert Oppenheimer said the best way to send an idea is to wrap it up in a person. Theological word, incarnation, in the flesh. The fleshly appearance of God is Jesus. The Bible says no man can, can see God at any time without dying. God is a spirit. So because I can't get to him, he comes to me and he takes upon himself a body. That's the incarnation. God himself in the flesh. 100% man, so he could demonstrate how it is that we should live as a human being, but 100% God. And he comes to reveal this message. I don't know if you ever met any famous people in your life. Living in New York City, sometimes you accidentally run into famous people. Actors, athletes, media. There's a difference in actually knowing a person and just saying hello. I think I've shared this, but a long time ago, I, I bumped into Jerry Seinfeld in Central Park. And he said, hello. And I said, uh, hello. That's my big claim to famous people. Do I know Jerry Seinfeld? No. I can make assessments about people. Oh, that guy looks pretty nice. She's a bad dresser. That guy likes to eat. You know, we can make assessments, but we don't really know somebody until we converse and talk to them. Your word 
is the ultimate expression of who you are. So God says, you know what? I don't want man just to kind of make assessments about who I am. Maybe, maybe God loves me. Maybe God only loves me when I do good. Maybe God's not there all the time. I don't want mankind to just guess. So I want them to know me. And the greatest expression of myself is my word. And I'm going to take my word and embody it in flesh and send it to them. So the idea is if you and I want to know God, listen to Jesus. He's an expression of God. And when Jesus is walking around on the earth three times, the Father says, Behold, this is my beloved Son. This is my representation. Hear ye him. Listen to him. He speaks to us. A little girl once said, some of us could not hear God's inside whisper, so he sent Jesus to talk to us out loud. God's a spirit. You can't kill a spirit. So he took a human bodily form to be killable, to die, to be crucified, and he lived so that we could see God. And he showed he's the bridge between God and man. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. His message, there's life, but it's in Jesus. There's light, but it's in Jesus. Nobody loves you more than Jesus. And if a person will turn to Jesus today and, and repent and just, Lord, I believe salvation, new birth, life is theirs forever. If you've never made that decision, in a moment we're going to invite you to do that. But for those of us who have, what are we doing to tell other people? Who are those people? Our parents, our children, our family. Guy who sits in the office six feet away from me. Those strangers I meet every day. Am I doing all that I can to share the only message that will make a difference in the world and for eternity. That's God's desire for us. And as we pray today, may God help us to take his message and to share it with as many people as we can. I hope you'll join me in doing that. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed. In a moment, we're just going to have a a brief invitation. Look, if you need to come today to pray, you need to come talk to someone. Maybe God's put somebody on your heart. Maybe you're a believer and you say, you know, the truth is, the last thing I'm thinking about right now is other people and their spiritual well-being. But I realize that's what I need to be thinking about. That's why I'm here. Today, maybe it's just you saying, Lord, keep me focused. God, my family, those people, I used to pray for them all the time and I stopped. I don't want to stop. Those people in my apartment building, those people who live next door to me, my coworkers, God, give me opportunities, give me wisdom, help me to realize that's why I'm here. They have no hope, they have no sense of, of life if they don't know you. If you're a Christian today, a believer, would you pray that with me? God, use me to point people to you. And if you're here today, maybe you're saying, you know, the truth is, Pastor, while you're preaching, I don't know that I have that relationship. I want that relationship with God. It's through Jesus. It's not by coming to church here. It's not by being a good person. Jesus loved you so much that he came here. Despite all you've done, despite all I've done, Though we are in darkness, he came because he loved us. And he offers life. It's no accident that you're here today. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I died, if something happened to me, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. I'd like to go to heaven. I'd like to know that Jesus is my Savior once for all. With heads bowed and Nobody's going to come to you or call your name, but before I pray, I would just like to remember to pray for you in my heart. 
I wonder if you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'd go to heaven. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. Would you please pray for me? If that's you, just slip a hand up and put it right back down, and I'll just remember you in my heart. God bless you. Thank you. Pray for me. God bless you. Thanks. And I will. Look, in a moment, Ryan's just going to play strum in the background. We're going to stand in a moment to just close and prayer, but it, I'd invite you to come. And when you come, I'll be here, and one of our pastors, one of our Bible teachers will be here to just open a Bible, take you into one of our classrooms, and just the two of you could sit down, and they would open a Bible and answer any question you have. And today could be that day that very clearly and simply you find out how you could put your trust in Jesus Christ. So whether you raised a hand or didn't, we want to give you that opportunity today to respond. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll take a moment or two, of just silence and let God work in our hearts. And if God deals with you today, I invite you to come. Let's do this. Let's stand while I pray. Can we do that? Lord, I pray that you would bless this invitation. Lord, I pray that you would just work in hearts today. Thank you for those that raised their hand. And Lord, if they have those doubts, if they're not sure, I pray that even today, Lord, they would talk with someone. They'd come here in a moment. Lord, there may be others who they have those questions. They're not sure. They didn't raise a hand, but that's okay. But I pray today they might come and just let somebody open a Bible and share with them how today could be the day they put their trust in you, that they could be born into the family of God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your message. Thank you for doing all that you've done. But now you give us a choice. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to choose you. And Lord, I pray for us as believers that we'll be convicted, challenged to do something to share Jesus with those who don't know you. It's hard, it's difficult, many don't want to hear it, but I pray we won't be discouraged. We'll keep praying, we'll keep at it because that's why we're here. We do it because we love you, we do it because we love them. We do it because somebody did it for us. So Lord, I pray that you would help us today as we think about people to do all that we can to share your message. Bless this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed. Would you just stand with me or there where you sit or if you want to kneel or if you want to come, you want to talk, you want to pray, you come. We're not going to tarry, but just a minute. But Christians, would you pray today? Let's just take a moment of, of quiet reflection and prayer while Ryan plays. You come if God speaks to you today. You respond. Dear Lord, I thank you for your message. I thank you that you came for us to bring life and light, to show the greatest love that could ever be seen. So Lord, I pray today as we go forth that we'll remember as recipients of that, we'll rejoice no matter how bad we think things are, and that we won't ever forget what you've done for us. And that we'll just rejoice. And for whatever time you have us here on this earth, Lord, we'll do all that we can to speak about you, to point people to you, because honestly, you are the only hope. You're the one with all the answers. And Lord, we know there are still people who want to hear about it, or we wouldn't be here. So Lord, give us a burden again. Help us to all see how we could reach someone else, that we'll invite people, we'll pray for people, we'll share what you've done in our lives with others pray you do that. And Lord, pray for anybody today that may still have questions themselves. Even after the service is over, they'll come talk to me or someone, and today would be the day, Lord, they put their trust in you. God, we love you. We thank you for all you've done. Lord, I pray we'll be encouraged as we head home. Bless 
all the ministries this afternoon, ESL and services tonight. And Lord, take us home with your blessing as we prepare for the week. Keep us safe, but help us to stay focused on that which is important to you. God, thank you for this great uh, day of worship. It's good to see so many people back and people gone. And Lord, I pray we'll just continue to see others. Thank you for our guests. And just build your church, Lord, for your honor and your glory. Bless the offering, Lord, as people leave today and as we worship you, as we give. Bless, Lord, meet the needs here and our missionaries. Bless them all around the world. Keep them safe in, in, in countries, Lord, that we pray. And, and, Lord, I just pray your name will be glorified. We love you. We thank you. Send us home with your blessings, we pray. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. 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 God bless you. We love you. Glad to see you here today. Be here every week. Don't miss a week.